Um, I'm Amy Smallwood. I'm CEO for the Louisiana Cultural Economic Foundation. And we have been working with the citizens here in Arneville for probably five years um, to just help facilitate the process of transforming a 25,000 square foot abandoned hospital facility into a French immersion center, which would be one of a kind in the US. Um, I was shocked when I came and spoke with all these folks about the fact that in order to er learn Cajun French, everybody was going to, um, to Canada. St. Anne's. To St. Anne's. And they, nobody could come here. Um, and it's so amazing with the indigenous here, one in eight families in this community still speaks French at home. And here we have Creole, we have Cajun, we have European French. Um, and, it's, and it's blossoming from there. It's amazing what's going on in this town. So we want to, um, today, we're just talking about the kinds of things that could happen in this facility. It is a big building. It needs a lot of work. We're, um, we do not have legal possession of it at this moment, but we're making progress um, in, the, in um, moving it in that direction. And, and, um, Mr. Bill is going to update us on that. But in the meantime, I think it's an opportunity for us to dream a little about what we would like to see happen in that facility. And also, what we think that facility brings as a resource to the entire state and perhaps the entire country. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the, uh, the kind of out-of-the-box things that could happen there. And later on today, we'll talk a little bit about the education part of it, because um, obviously the universities are very interested and um, are coming to town. But first, I'd like to call up Mr. Bill Fontenot, who's the parish president for St. Landry Parish. And Bill, if you'll come sit with me, we'll sure. have a little conversation and uh, talk about what's going on. Okay. Will this reach? Sit. Yeah. I'm going to give you this mic, okay. and um, maybe you can update us a little bit. All right. How many of you have an idea of what's going on? Is it still working? Yeah. Yeah. Do I have an idea? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I know those for many faces do, but uh, it's somewhat of a long story, but it's, it's pretty simple the way I see it. In the 1960s, the building, as Amy described it, was set up here by uh, a person who was a doctor at that time, grew up here, and was very concerned about community health. And uh, at, in the 60s, I mean, I'm 65, and uh, so you know, I can remember the 60s, and but sometimes your memory fades. I don't remember that it was much trouble to travel and maybe I just didn't go very, move around very much. <laughs> Lived in the country up uh, about 20 miles from here. A wonderful family. I grew up in a wonderful family that's called French, basically French. And uh, my parents were one of those that could tell that story that when they went to school and they could only speak French, they were punished for speaking French. They had to speak English because this was a time when education was in a formation period where English was being taught in a formal way, and they wanted all Americans to speak French. I mean, to speak English. So all these little French kids, they insisted that they that they abandon their French, speak English. But of course, when they went home, they went back to speak French. So our parents, my parents, and the generation that I am, our parents spoke French and English because they had to speak uh, English to make their way to school and not be actually uh, punished, uh, and of course, back then they punished with a rod, you know, they spanked them. So, uh, so in my family, when we sat around, there was a lot of French and English going on mixed. So, even though they didn't speak to us, say, on a regular basis, one on one in French, uh, we picked up all of that French by them speaking to their sisters, brothers, in laws, and then some of us did eventually speak French with them. I don't speak that, speak that fluently because kind of many of us in my generation don't because we have trouble tying the little words, the, the big words uh, together with the little words. So uh, 
uh, I wish I could do a better job. But I'm certainly proud, and I know my parents are proud that uh, I'm involved in this. This is one. Of, I'm a civil engineer by profession. This is in my life one of the the most uh, enjoyable, uh, fascinating, rewarding jobs I've had in, uh, in my work career. And you've been Even, committed to this project from the very beginning, which has yeah. been incredible for it, us. It came to life to me when I first took on this job. But I'm a civil engineer, and civil engineers don't, don't become politicians. But I worked in the political environment for the state of Louisiana. Uh, as a bureaucrat, I was a regional administrator overseeing uh, eight parishes and 2,500 miles of state and federal highways. So a lot of training and highway work involved. So I come here, no one to feel well, but didn't realize this jewel was here. And at the time I come in, five years ago, and again, as someone mentioned here, we're in a two parish space because our bill is in two parishes because of the water, mostly as people travel up the bayous, they settle on the streams, and one of those settled here ended up being in two parishes. And it's been a, a good and a bad relationship in a way because now with the, with the legalese and the, all the, lit the litigious, the, uh, the paths that we have followed to do anything uh, right today, it has to be legal. And of course, uh, and we want it to be legal, and we want it to be legal, but sometimes the politics plays into that and makes it a tougher struggle. But we're actually sitting here today at the end of, a, of a, at least a five-year path for me. I know others here had the dream probably before that because the hospital had closed before I arrived. And the whole idea is here's this building that's created by the government, the local government, under the uh, laws of, of the state of Louisiana and the local laws that the state allows local governments to make. Uh, a, a district, a taxing district was created that included portions of two parishes. It supported the hospital. Uh, it, it mandated that a board be created and they were appointed by the two parishes. And they serve at the pleasure of the two parish governments. And uh, as it wind, uh, wound down, I guess, the right word, uh, winding down, uh, because actually from the 60s to the 90s and into the 2000s, I guess, <clears throat> you know, we had the interstates that showed up, uh, people were more mobile. Uh, Healthcare more specialized. So rather than going to the, the country hospital or the country doctors, and he was a great doctor, Dr. Morrow and his partner, and continued to practice on even though the hospital had closed. But there was less need for it. So he had, and this was a full fledged hospital, it had birthing units, uh, had uh, emergency room. Oh, had, George was born there, weren't you, George? Yeah, George was born in room 32 or what, what number? <laughs> No, but what, what room number? You have the room number. 1932. No, no. I meant the room number. You were born in room 30-something. Anyway, George points out where you're born. And uh, anyway, the, as it turns out, the building becomes vacant because of lack of need and use. And uh, the board continued to operate because it was still legally in place. And uh, as I arrived and uh, took the oath of office in 2012, got a call from someone on the board, or maybe it was the lady representing it, would like to meet with myself and the president of uh, St. Mark Parish. And basically, those four or five board members that were there said, we, they tell us the same story I'm telling you. They said, now here we are with a building that has, you know, has some worth and value to it, but we can't get any clients. So how do we, and it had a million and a half dollars in the bank, and they, put, they actually abandoned collecting taxes because they didn't need the taxes anymore. You know, the collection of taxes, nothing to, to put it to, to spend it on, other than to maintain the building. So says, how do we get out from under this? Because the law was written that says it can only be used for hospital-related uh, matters. And so Mr. Cormier, as myself, being in government for a while, said, well, we'll just find us a lawyer that'll figure this out. So we did, and there the journey started. But somehow, within that first year, when they discovered that potentially, talking about the board, when they discovered potentially that the clients that, that, we, that we had, because the whole idea was just abolish the district, abolish the board, put the hands back into the mother uh, originator, which was the parish government, it would go back to the parish government. You don't need another board to oversee the operation of the building that was not being operated. 
so it didn't become an asset of both parishes to use as they wish. But when they found that potential uh, clients of the building might be French immersion, they started having uh, these uh, horrendous opinions about who would occupy the building. Although I'm sure they should have seen what was occurring, but I think they were just uh, had an narrow vision because I think French students had begun to come by then, right? To enjoy what you had here, which was a learning experience. And thanks to Emmanuel Fleur, who just arrived uh, with the university. Uh, universities probably worked at more than one, UL, LSU, and uh, she's a pro and, uh, uh, um, and very involved in French. Anyway, we made all these connections, and George and Mavis can tell you how they forged into the French consul's office and said, you this idea, we think it's going to do well for, you know, develop, not developing, but helping us continue to live our culture, which includes real Asian French, even some Indian, I believe. And in other words, going back into the history of our humanity and our, and our language here. So where are we now? So, to get to that point, we have to pass laws. Our lawyers got together and said, now we've got to pass laws ordinances to undo the legislation. And uh, we have a, a very fine private law, law firm that Adams and Reese who's worked the ordinances and both for anything to happen with the hospital, since both parishes own the hospital, uh, they had to both pass identical ordinances for it to be effective and legal. Uh, and there's a story about how long it took to get that done, but eventually in the end, uh, in the beginning of this year, January, February, both parishes uh, passed the proper ordinances, laws to uh, dissolve the board, dissolve the district, and put it back into the hands, the maintenance operation uh, into the hands of both parishes, because there is dual ownership. And both parishes are also in the middle of signing uh, a cooperative endeavor agreement that will divide the assets. It's sort of like an amicable divorce. We own the assets, but the building and the land is in St. Andrew Parish, but the district uh, also involved taxes collected in St. Martin. So there was a, a formula that arrived for when we divide the assets, the assets are money, the land, and the building. So it makes sense that the land and the building, if they're in St. Landry, they should get that. And that has a value. And then the rest of the money is proportioned, and St. Martin gets money. Everybody's satisfied with it. We passed it. It passed unanimously in St. Martin, seven to six in St. Landry, and we still have some naysayers that are, even though we've passed the law, the laws are legal, and uh, the uh, at the time of the passing of the law, the board, well, that was a board, after the law is passed, there is no longer a board immediately after it's passed. Those people, which are no longer a board, have now taken hostile possession, I say taken, they've always had it in that possession when they were aboard, but they will not release the keys, nor will they release the documents. I should have been able to, uh, since it will be in St. Landry Parish, as the administrator and responsible party for the hospital, I should have been able to just walk over and get the keys and the records and begin operating the day after the law was passed. But they took hostile possession, uh, didn't speak to us, shut off all communications except for a lawyer that said the laws were incorrect. So now that, that was uh, mid-February and in May, May the 5th, we have a, an action that's filed called a writ of mandamus, which is an action we file against uh, uh, public officials or former public officials for uh, actions that are not appropriate. So they have hostile possession of it and we look for uh, this matter to go before a judge May the 5th and on that day, a mandamus requires that the judge make a decision. So that's what's in the process now. Both lawyers, lawyer for our side and lawyer for their side, for you know writing their briefs and explaining their position. So we're looking forward to a favorable, uh, favorable uh, decision because it, it just you know I guess I would say only here in St. Andrew Parish that could happen. But you know, look, we have Donald Trump, so I mean, you know, so they're crazy things that have happened. You know. so I'm not a but I'm just, but it has a lot to do with, you know, how, how, how society can move forward. Sometimes it just, that's what's great about America. Any few people can get together and stop us in our tracks, the good people. So I think the good people need to be strong, not give up and continue 
the fight. And that's what so I, Cinco, I represent. Cinco de Mayo is the day. May 5th, that's a Friday. Yeah. So we should, we should like celebrate. Sounds like a celebration to me. On a Friday night, we should uh, stay up all night. Yeah. 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 So, who, who has some questions for the, about this? We can't hear you. Yeah, you I might come up here. I have a question for Bill. Sure. Bill, the record, the, the filing that's been filed with the court, is that public record? Oh, yeah, it's all public. Sure. Okay, so can I go to the courthouse and get a copy of it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Specifically what they're asking for the judge to decide? Right, exactly. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, which, which judge will make this decision? Right now it's on the, uh, uh, it's in Judge Doherty's court. There are four judges, and they, you know, rotate by lottery who, who hears what case. They don't decide that on their own. I mean, if, if one's overloaded, I guess they would make a decision. But Judge Dart is a good and fair judge. He's been there for uh, many years. And he's, you know, he's from our area. And he uh, has a great appreciation for, but no matter if you have a good appreciation or not about your culture and about the law and about what we're trying to do, you've got to follow the law. But it makes sense to everybody except the five people that the law should be that they should turn over those keys and the records. John? I, I might have missed something. Um, what is their problem? Why don't they? <laughs> <laughs> she asked, and y'all can't hear, what is their problem? Yeah, they, uh, they, what do they want to do with the building? Then? Nothing. I mean, they don't have any plans. In fact, we gave them. In fact, some of the discussions in the beginning were, look, while you guys are working on a solution legally to get us out from under this, because that's how they expressed it. Here we are as a board, we have nothing to really govern, so please help us get out from under it. Then they did a complete 180 about six months into it when they found out some of the people in this group that were in there, they don't like their views, uh, their positions you know, within, within the human race, and uh, so they disliked the movement. But they're just five people, and maybe, and actually six if I count the council, and that, that's another political issue. But we need a new councilman in this area to be a champion as we move forward because we're going to need that as we put this building into uh, commerce and hopefully, as far as I'm concerned, into French immersion. But we'll need a strong ally there. Of course. I think what surprised a lot of us is that um, they had a very provincial view of artists. Yeah, they don't like And uh, they were terrified at this image of you know, what would come into their small town and how it would change as a result of artists taking um, control of this area. But I can tell you this, that since you opened up, the um, tax collections have increased 40%. And, the, and the, So um, the, the economic impact of it, of course, is huge. And keep in mind, you know, Amy says the truth. We, 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 uh, we did all that data mining that shows the taxes are way up. And we still have, it's just, a, unfortunately, you know, mankind, you know, doesn't change much, even though we become more educated, but there's the, just those very few that are still very bigoted people. They don't like uh, that artists represent hippie types, they say, uh, gay people, uh, black people. Uh, I mean, we've had loads of black people come here that speak French, Nigeria, right? Or, uh, which, which company? Haiti. Haiti. I mean, they, uh, the, the, I mean, and this was not just one small group. This group was accompanied by Mr. Joy Durrell, who was the mayor president of Lafayette, who wanted to show uh, these folks all of Acadia. And, and this was a jewel. Look at the mayors, like all the Francophone yeah. mayors. The no, Francophone mayors. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, this, this has been, you can find this place in magazines from uh, uh, Canada to Louisiana back to France. I mean, there's a lot been written. There's a lot of hope and uh, optimism uh, in that community. So we've now laid the foundation for everybody understanding where we are in the process. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, that light is um, Mr. Fontenot having the keys and full possession of the building and its records. Um, having a, a, a pot of money that's available for him if he chooses, as the, as the parish chooses, to 
do some repairs to the building. We understand that it's um, suffered in recent years from lack of air conditioning and vandalism. Um, we also are hoping and encouraging um, Mr. Botno to immediately file some claims on the insurance they've been paying for all these years because they've not even gone into the building to assess damage after vandals have been in there. So, um, and just to let you know, the issues that they've caused and the expense that they have caused just by not having a smooth transition, is we had no idea if we knew they had insurance because they claimed about they claimed about the cost of it because it costs more to insure a building that's unoccupied than occupied. It goes from about eight thousand to thirty-five thousand. But we had no way to determine if they'll continue to pay that insurance. So once the law said it was the parish government's building then we couldn't take the chance, so we had to buy a policy. So that's double insurance, so you know they've caused us another expense. And we know they've been in and out of there making a lot of noise for witnesses, so we don't know if they're <laughs> scrupulously going in there and damaging things, which would be foolish. But uh, these are, uh, and, I, and I, it's unfortunate that it's just a focus on very few, because we had a business plan that was funded by uh, both parish uh, governments, parish president Cormier and myself, uh, and National the, of the, Arts. the Arts put together, I don't know, fifty, eighty thousand dollars to come up because people naysayers were saying, well, and this was planted by those five or eight people uh, that well, this will never work. How will you pay for it? And uh, actually, the business plan took I don't know, a few months. Very, uh, we went through an RFP, a very qualified firm. They interviewed. 90% of the people along the Tesh, not just in St. Bain and St. Martin, because this is an impact regionally. When these when citizens come and students come, they want to see all of Acadiana. And naturally what comes with that is spending money and learning about our culture and all. But the citizens that were interviewed, I think the number was something like 85 or 90% said yes, we would like to see French immersion. George? Yeah, I think it was over 90. Yeah, I think it was 6% that were indifferent and only yeah. 4%. But it's unheard of that you would get that much of a buy-in yeah. on something that was making so much news about the negative side. Of right. That and they also indicated in their study that um, it's an extremely financially viable project that they expect to be making profit within three years. Right. Yes. Can I say something real quick, please? Okay. Um, this morning, I got an email both uh, text and bill for some information on this. And this is Jerry Red. He's off. Oh, Jerry, welcome. Okay. Hey, Jerry. Thanks for being here. And Jerry uh, is a member, of course, as they all are, the parish council members of the national, the, 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 the national, the national uh, association of counties. So there's an awards award that they give out annually for cultural development. So I see this email, I call them on the, I called up the National Association and spoke with the woman. Gary got them to extend the deadline to today, from yesterday, it was yesterday, but we have till five o'clock this afternoon. And so I called and said, well, we can't do this. The, the facility's not up yet. And Jerry said, but you're doing the program. He <laughs> says, for well, five years, you've been yes. doing the program. And he says, you can still come in for that. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm so be around smart people. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm going to try and get to the computer today to start looking at that and working on that. But again, the programming is going on. And right. that's important to know. And that's where Amanda and Mavis can fill you in on that. All the universities that are coming here, how they've got the template already started. Correct? And, and the more that are calling and wanting to that's awesome, and thank you so much for getting that extension because that's really important. Because you all are doing the programming. Many, many people have been coming here all this time. You may have a separate round table where that's going on. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, I want to thank Jerry publicly that I, I always do when I see him, and I didn't, I didn't notice him speak in there. But uh, thank you, Jerry. For, Jerry uh, is chairman of our 13-member council, and Jerry is one of the as you hear there by that testimony, one of the awesome supporters, solid supporters. I believe you were the tie-breaking vote at yes, the sir. last meeting. Yes, you were. Yes, yes. And, and 
and he was, and, and he was not bashful about casting. He was very, yeah. Jerry was very strong. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I welcome Jerry as a partner in this effort. Thank you, Jerry, so much. So I feel good, like we've got this foundation of what we are going to do today, which is dreaming a little bit about what kinds of things could happen there. And Bill, I want to thank you for your comments and sure. then ask you to vacate your chair because right. I'm going to call two other people up here that I want to talk about um, a business event. Okay. Thank you. All right. thank, thank you. Thank you. For I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, and I said, as I said earlier, I think Jerry would agree it's one of the most rewarding projects we've been afforded. Thank you all for being here because although everyone is here, like you heard us testify, 90% of people said yes, we want it, we're proud of our, our culture, we want to continue it, and this is a way to do it. They're all wanted, but they're busy working, so we yes. need people to come and, uh, and spend their time. We know you have other places you could be, so thank you. Thank you, Bill. You've been the most amazing um, advocate for this project ever. So, and thanks for your conversation, you. Joni and Robert Hodes. I'd love for you guys to come up and chat with me for a minute. Um, one of the things that we talked about when we originally dreamed of what could happen in this fair was, I mean, in this um, in this building was, gee, wouldn't it be kind of cool to also be able to incubate? small businesses in the creative industries, um, I'll say. And um, yeah, that's a tall order. Um, but I think, you know, it, uh, all, you, all you can do is put one foot in front of the other and, and see if something works, because I've noticed that there are a lot of people here in this community and surrounding communities that have small businesses that they're trying to launch in very early stage creative businesses. And in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Louisiana Cultural Economy Foundation have partnered to have uh, just such an incubator. And we now have uh, five businesses in the incubator. We have space for up to 12. They, um, they well, I'll let you guys tell, tell them what you guys do. And I'll, these, these are a, an awesome example of the kind of business that's in an incubator. It's very diverse and very, eclectic and interesting to see what people come up with. So take it from here, Joni and Robert, and tell them what you do. Well, hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, i got to say before I say anything else, God bless Louisiana, and God bless the culture of Incubator. You know, uh, Amy mentioned putting one foot in front of the other. Well, my wife and I moved to New Orleans in July of 2016 which is not very long ago, from uh, from New York City. And uh, we decided before coming here, I graduated two in 1977. I've always loved New Orleans. We made a trip together at the beginning of 2012. We started coming down three, four, five times a year. And we decided, you know, we should kind of semi-retire and do it in New Orleans and become tour guides. Right. So we went to Delgado, we got our tour guide licenses, and then we started working on a business plan. And we said, how are we going to do this? Do we want to do walking tours in the French Quarter at our age in the middle of June, July, and August? <laughs> I don't think so. So <clears throat> we stumbled upon the idea of getting an electric vehicle and souping it up, putting it in an air conditioner. It only holds four people. We made contact with the <laughs> Historic New Orleans collection. They loved the idea. The city, we went and did a presentation. They loved the idea. And all of a sudden, everybody is just opening their arms to us. Unfortunately, there's laws in, in New Orleans. And if you want to have a business, you have to have a business address. So we have to find a place, a place to rent. So I, the, first, the second call I made was to this advertisement. When I spoke with Amy, and she kind describe this cultural economy foundation. I don't even know what that is. But I said, I'm coming with you. We go in, we sit down, we chat. She looks at me, she says, you know, you're a cultural creative. And I said, I am? And she says, yes. And then it, I realized it's really true. Our goal, our desire, as people that come from business backgrounds is 
strictly to bring the culture, the history of New Orleans and Louisiana and water scale to visitors that come to the state and into New Orleans and present it in a way that is truly factual. And that's what we're doing. So we joined this incubator. And since joining, I can only tell you, it's one of the smartest things. It's, it's, it's like serendipity. It, it's just a miracle. We have made so many connections at so many different levels. We've been helped with from bookkeeping, QuickBooks, through to a boot camp uh, for business. Uh, there are mentors that have worked with us. Uh, it, it's just really been a fabulous thing. E even the uh, Chamber of Commerce in New Orleans was kind of a free association with the Louisiana uh, Economic Development Foundation to, uh, and the uh, humanities to offer us a free membership in the Chamber of Commerce. So we have received all of these wonderful things. And when Amy said, you know, we're doing this thing up in Arnoldville. Have you ever been up there? And the answer was, no, I've never been there, but I'd like to check it out. She said, would you come on up and maybe talk a little bit about the incubator? I, I'm so honored to be here to uh, just to tell you how great it is. And, you know, we're the old fogies uh, in the incubator. There's a lot of other guys in there that are a lot younger than us. But there's also, uh, there's camaraderie within the incubator. Everybody's helping everybody. And it's just a really wonderful thing. So I, I hope that this project gets off the ground. I love it. I, I plan to come back here. And I hope you end up putting in an incubator because I'm sure there's young people walking around that don't know their cultural creatives and can use a little bit of help on the business side to, to get themselves up and running. Joni and I opened up our business last month, and it looks like it's going to be really successful. Thank you, Robert. And so, um, for those of you who don't know, um, one of the things that an incubator can do for an emerging business, we like to say that in Louisiana, culture means business. Because it is a, such a huge economic driver, and it is so impactful to every other kind of business there is. This is one of the reasons why we solicited the Chamber of Commerce to give free memberships to our incubator members because not only is it important for incubator members to rub elbows with other businesses and take advantages, advantage of the opportunities, they need to think of themselves as businesses. And conversely, traditional business owners need to think of creatives as businesses as well. So um, and the impact that creatives have on the whole business community is huge. So, um, you know, I want everybody to think about the, the concept that some of that space in that building could conceivably use to incubate emerging businesses in the creative industries um, and training and, and like you said, boot camps. And we just finished a, uh, a QuickBooks training where everybody got free software. And, um, I'll just tell you that some of the other incubator members, it's very diverse. Is, um, we have a group called um, Two Girls, One Shop, and they are a traveling oyster bar that is that trains women to shuck oysters and um, sort of breaks those barriers of the, being an all-male industry. And they um, go into the schools and talk to children about shucking oysters and about um, Louisiana seafood. We have a, a business called Culturalist, which is an online platform that connects creatives and uh, financial support, uh, financial supporters directly. So that, you know, if I love, say, Big Sam's Funky Nation, I could go online and support them and I would get something in return, like Backstage Pass or a snippet of a new song. Um, we have a, um, a culinary business called Coco and Cream Catering and Food Truck, and they have just actually launched their second food truck and are now negotiating for an event space in New Orleans East. And uh, who am I moving out? Oh, our newest member. Um, his name is Trap Bonner, and he has a business called Preston City Media Group, and he's working on a film project. Uh, actually, it's a multimedia project, but film on Buddy Bolden, who is the 
um, we, we believe was the grandfather of jazz music. So you can see that they're all um, very different and and it, it's only limited by the imagination, wouldn't you say? So tell us just um, quickly, what what do you think that an incubator like this could do for this community? Gosh, I, I think it would bring in so many different walks of life. And I know that these five or six people don't want to hear it. Some people don't like change. I get that. But what it will do for the community as a whole, I mean, how much revenue are we talking about? We're going to bring so much revenue from the um, property values we go up. Just because it's artsy doesn't mean that they don't know what's going on. That's, that's what always tells me about the, um, the view of an arts community. Like, mean, look at Woodstock and York. I mean, it's private, huge business. Still crunchy, granola, cute, wonderful. But these people are brilliant. They they all have their masters from universities. It's, it's incredible. So I think if we if you could get the argument to these five or six people, if they would you know, qualify why this would be horrible besides their own personal opinions, that would be terrific. And also, aren't you supposed to go with the, the community as a whole? If it's 90%, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I think Bill is going with the community as a whole. I think now yeah. that there's this new yeah. thing, little thing, filed. Right. That voice. That's, would that's be, the line in the sand. That voice would go away, that negative voice. It's, yeah, it's, it's voice. just too bad that it's it's just more time and money. Right. They just lost spent on lost something else. Yeah. Absolutely true. They, they, press, they practice the American. Right. Nothing has changed in Louisiana politics since 1699. <laughs> 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 so thank you guys so much for representing the incubator and um, telling us about how you know what it's like to be in one and how it could work. Um, the best state the world. We love it here. Oh, thank you. We love hearing that. We're. Uh, we're New Yorkers. <laughs> now we're New Orleans. Albert, yes. And Louisiana. Very proud of it. Does anybody have any questions for them? No? Oh, I just have, I'm just curious. Uh, about, you know, personally, so your, your only connection to Louisiana before this was to Maine? Yes. Yes. The first time, the first time we go down here, um, we stayed in fresh water at the Bourbon Orleans. I was told that I was wanted, I was all scared and everything, but I got off the airplane and I came over here, I came over here. I grew up on Long Island, I went to school in, um, in Poughkeepsie, New York. I, I mean, I worked Wall Street for over 20 years with Merrill Lynch. I, I'm a New Yorker, but in 2012, I was like, I gotta get out of here. You know, after, after all the craziness in New York and stuff, it was time to move on and I had to find another home. It was always like, oh, Florida, maybe Georgia. I never even thought about New Orleans until we walked down there. We, we love it. That we cannot, every day we pinch ourselves, we cannot believe that we're here. We're so glad to have you. Yeah. yeah. And the vehicle that they've created is an amazing little car. Um, yeah, we created it because I didn't like to walk. <laughs> and we made our business New Torleans. Yes. Or you could say New Torleans. Or you could say New Torleans. <laughs> <It's wild. laughs> Thank you both so much. I have, I have one quick question. How are you doing in competition against the carriages? Because to me it sounds like I would rather be in the air conditioning and have a tour than sitting in the carriage now. How are they doing? They're the doing carriages, are they phasing out? No, no, they're going strong. Uh, you know, there's a lot of them, and we have one vehicle. We take four people at a time. We okay. do two, two tours a day, and that's five enough. days a week. Yeah. And you know, we ultimately what we would like to do is get back to the community. So we just opened. We're going to probably spend at least six months to a year working out all the kinks, getting it going, show a profit. 
And then we want to introduce uh, another vehicle and hire some local Ugalians to ride the vehicle. So my wife will drive one, I'll drive the other. We'll train them as guides after they do all the courses and all that. And we'll try to make it a, a bigger thing than yeah. it is. And we want them to be salaried, so they're right. making a living. Not so when, when are you no longer is. able to be part of the incubator? Well, then what we're works. saying it's after a year, but no, two, two years. They have a two-year contract. I can stay there forever. We will because it's perfect. We, we, you know, we don't need an office. Our business is based on the land. We're in the vehicle, yeah. but we we love the association, yeah. and you know, we want to give back to the community. That's part of why we're here. So, so the so I guess my question is to Amy. So, as an incubator, just help me understand. An incubator allows you. Stay forever, or an incubator requires you to become a full-fledged business and then move on. Our incubator has a two-year limit. However, and we sign a contract. However, if they're ready to launch and, and be somewhere else or be bigger, before that they can leave. So what we do is we provide the office space. They they spend two hundred fifty dollars a month for the office space. Um, it, and they have free copies, they have coffee and water, and they have somebody who's, you know, a receptionist. Um, beautiful meeting rooms, total AV capability, and then um, other resources like the free chamber membership um, that we put together trainings that they're interested in. The, the one we're working on right now is a boot camp in marketing, digital media, digital marketing. Um, we partner with the Louisiana Small Business Development Center to put together trainings that they need. Or want so the good books training, um, the boot camp that we've done, and then whenever they're, what we try to do is just remember them in terms of sharing our resources. So you know, like if I get free tickets to something, I'll tell tell them. Um, and you know, if I meet individually with members of the incubator, and if they have a certain need, I try to, I try to find somebody who can fulfill it. Plus, on top of that, we have 13 mentors who are in various fields and really very substantial individuals in the community and they're ready and willing and able to help them in any way that they can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In that respect to it, is it sort of like SCORE? Did you say? Uh, tell me about SCORE. SCORE is where mentors of different businesses help organizations or upcoming businesses. Uh, let's say if somebody wants to go into Take 
the culture and the heritage that you guys are creating within Louisiana and distribute it across all of citizens of Louisiana. The education department, uh, and, and so with the content department, we have a magazine, we have an online database, um, and we have a bunch of people who run around the state like crazy and, <laughs> and, and do a lot of things. We also have the moms who on Main Street, wards, banquets, and we and, and got it. Uh, the Division of Education works with citizens of Louisiana to help them understand and digest culture of their state. And so with that, we have uh, our, our, our main program is the Primetime Family Reading Program. Uh, we have two versions. We have a preschool version and a family reading time version. The reason, the reason why this is part of the Louisiana Endowment for Humanities is, is it's a family-based intergenerational storytelling program. So we have people gather within a room and experience the same book, children's book, and then have a humanities-based discussion on that children's book. It teaches parents how to question their children on grade level. It also teaches children and parents how to interact um, in a way, in, in, in a deeper way they may not have, have thought um, of doing before. Um, so it stretches people into critical thinking and higher order uh, thinking skills that are necessary in order to really in enjoy some of the content that's being produced by this one state. Um, and so that's kind of a, a general overview of our program. With that, we also have a, a, a kind of like this experimental side project called Seven. Uh, we have a superfluous amount of books. We have lots of books, <laughs> of children's books from these grand family reading time programs. Um, and some of them are bilingual. We have bilingual Spanish books, we have bilingual French books. We also have books in English. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways we thought to use these books to have better help citizens is that we give out 70 books uh, on loan. Loan. <laughs> loan. <laughs> but um, we give 70 books at a time to any organization or individual who needs to either have an EIN number, which is a business number, a DUNS number, or a social security somehow legally track that it's you that has in these books. Um, and you get them for 70 days, and the only thing you're required to do is create 70 experiences. What you define an experience in the application is what we judge you on as an experience. Uh, so it's extremely loose and open-ended. You, you can do whatever you want as long as these books are, are being used somehow creatively within the community. Um, Mavis has done it. Uh, I assume we're going to begin uh, the program, uh, and so you can get any selection of books, whether it be English only, English and French, French and Spanish, French and you know, French and English. So. so, you know, since we're here dreaming a little bit about mm -hmm. what could happen in this facility that's twenty-five thousand square feet, it has. Overnight capability for was it twenty five rooms, George? Twenty five rooms. Twenty five rooms. Um, you know, there's a, all sorts of other spaces. Great little operating rooms. And <laughs> there's a strange place where they appear to have locked up people who are tr troublesome. Um, but you know, what I'm saying is that there's this great space. What kind of resource might this renovated facility? offer, you know, for the state, for, you know, and from a humanities perspective. Two things that you mentioned earlier when you, when you were opening up was the international impact and the cultural impact of the space. And those two things that, you know, wrote down some notes about that because um, there were, there were some, I had some thoughts about that. The first one was um, redefining the concept that we have of this space having international impact or the potential of this space having international impact. I think that, that news is a very interesting example of that. Um, but what I think is most important is, um, I don't really think that international relevancy is, is important. Um, we should be relevant on a national level. We should be extremely relevant to the people, of the citizens who have put this place together. Um, the international level has a lot of lot of items and things for French, but it's but St. Luke's would be uniquely positioned to represent a, a section of the culture, a section of the population who may not be fully represented in any place else. And if we focus on an international um, 
an, inter an avenue for international cultural impact, we're missing the opportunity to fully realize the culture that is in the workplace. Um, and I think that if this place will be successful, it, it will depend on the fact that individuals within the community feel culturally represented within the space, more than internationally. Yeah, I think that's pretty profound, actually, mm -hmm. because um, I think one of the things we've recognized over the years is that what brings people here is the authenticity of this space and the people that are here. And um, though I think people will come internationally, I don't think, I don't yeah, think the yeah. emphasis is going to be on um, you know, inter the international community. I think definitely shining the light on what is so special about here is and what's really if we, important. If, we, if we're, we're going to vision, if, if I made a vision about this place, when we were thinking about positioning, if, if we begin the thought, we're thinking well, this is a place where we're going to to consider this one individual culture. And we're thinking about these rooms and this actual physical space we have, um, thinking about what needs to be done within this culture, this one individual culture, and, and setting aside an understanding that we may get back to an international impact. But with, when we think about this one individual space, um, we want the culture to be viable and healthy. And so that means that if, if the language is going to be alive, people need to be making unique and unique creative and new contemporary phrases or communication within that language. And there's a lot of steps <laughs> that, that has to happen before, before it gets there. Uh, people need to know the language, but there also needs, there, there's also this, this prevailing concept that you cannot create new forms until you fully preserve the old. And so even though it's important to have in a viable culture to have these new contemporary expressions, um, the first step is to stabilize what's, what's already there. Um, and so that, that means creating an archive um, of, of items or things relating within that culture. After you have an archive, you can then create a canon, something that, or, or a canon being either a museum or a library, something where if someone wants to get more information within a culture, they can go and you can point them to these specific items that may have more cultural value than sifting through an entire archive. Creating some method for them to say, you want to know about this culture, here's a place you can go, and here are the things you can experience, and through experiencing this, you have a very good idea of what our culture is. That's what it takes, and I, I personally think that that needs to happen in order to preserve the old culture. Once people are able to experience the old, then there's not this fear of the new. When people know that this, the, the, the history is preserved and intact, people can take that history and create new and develop new concepts within that. If there is no preservation of history and people try to develop new concepts before that, um, there's kind of this fear and rift within the culture that you're trying to superimpose this new contemporary thing and create a history from it. Um, and so the youth of St. Lambie and St. Martin Parish need you to create a canon so they can survive and be part of the culture. They're not capable of being new entities within this culture until we have stabilized the culture enough for them to grow and become individuals within it. Wow. That's, um, that's quite a task. So, um, you know, the beauty of it is that we will have the logical place for such a um, can. Um, I, I believe that in, you know, this new nonprofit organization that takes over and runs uh, the facility can certainly um, take that on as a, as a mandate. But, I mean, I think what you said sounds completely logical. Um, I've just never heard it said like that before, honestly. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate hearing that. Did you have a question, though? I just want to say that, uh, of course, you know, there's a generation between you and I, but we, we didn't even ask for this. You know, we, we are, correct me if I'm wrong, they started, people started coming and have been coming for a while. Be yeah, because of who we are. So, so we are the attraction. So we're not trying to be something for the international benefit. Yeah. Uh, we're just living our lives, and we certainly have, at least up to now, an appreciation of our parents and grandparents. 
and I think if we do a, a good job as parents, they will they will carry that forward. So it's pretty effortless for those of us who are genuine, and I think most of us are in this culture. So uh, uh, we we mostly are just continuing to live our culture, and people are coming to share with us. They're coming to visit and learn. And the academia here, with regard to French, they see a potential to learn more French, appreciate the culture, and uh, uh, it's, it's, this building is pretty simple. It's a space that can uh, complement the effort. It's just like in the, in the old days. We don't visit as much as I remember as, I, as when I was a kid. Neighbors visited, shared each other's experiences, helped each other as neighbors. That was just the, our way. And now we don't do it as much because we're faster, we're technology oriented and all. But we still have that fundamental value uh, of our culture. We continue to live it. Uh, I think this is a prime example of it here. And it's pretty effortless. I say effortless. It's effortless for those who love to. That's why I'm not worried about the building and its condition. Because this was two old barns and look mm -hmm. what they've created. It's a place that, uh, like no other, that I like to be, and I think most people who come continue to return to it. So it's just a living of our culture, and we're the attraction. So I don't think we're trying to build anything to sell. We're we're uh, we're just trying to accommodate our guests, basically. So we have this space. Uh, we want to accommodate. It's kind of like just doing what we used to always do. People come over, we want to have a place for them to sleep and learn to cook. Um. And, and I love how you put that. We're just accommodating our guests. Yeah. And before, before George, I wanted to say something. I'm kind of so excited that you want to say Okay. <laughs> but, um, and I think that speaks a lot to, to what I don't think I communicated well about the international mm -hmm. impact, is that um, we don't need to change anything. Right. You know, exactly. we're not, we yeah. don't, we're not we writing a book. Less. We're not writing yeah. a book for someone That's else. Right. We're yeah. documenting what we yeah. have. That's right. Even if that means videotaping what yeah. happens, we don't have to change. Yeah. They we want just to come. need to make sure yeah. that people that you may not meet personally are able to see what you're doing. Yeah. And to add to that, I think that we do have an George, opportunity. George, come and use the microphone. Since <laughs> <laughs> you tell us to tell everybody well, else. Uh, <laughs> 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 we also videotape it. I think that... Um, you know, um, adding to what you already said, is that we, we have a fantastic opportunity to dig even deeper. So um, I think oftentimes, you know, it's like the Cajunification of mm -hmm. Louisiana. There are, I think where I was talking earlier, there are what, over 18 different French dialects in the States, something like that. Mm -hmm. But if you focus just on this area, just on, on, on the St. Martin, St. Landry, and Lafayette areas. You know, you can identify particular groups of people, and just by focusing on those groups, you know, it's something very special, something that you're not going to find anywhere else in the state. Mm -hmm. And so, basically adding to what you already said, we have that opportunity to dig even deeper if we mm -hmm. focus on, you know, um, our native people. So. And also, um, even within like even an international impact, even a state impact. Um, I find within Louisiana, there is this um, this need to qualify our own worth based on others or based on other cultures. And I don't really think that's that's necessary. Look, it seems like we need to, to somehow compare ourselves or compare our language or compare things to, to other things to show that we're relevant. And I don't really think that's necessary. Um, we don't, St. Nunu's does not have to be Lafayette. St. Luke's does not have to be Lafouche or Terrebonne. Um, the thing that makes St. Luke's and the thing that makes St. Landry and the thing that makes St. Mary's, St. Martin is important is, is the unique aspects of that. And um, perfect, imperfect, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but those things need to be somehow documented or, or seen, but not changed. Right, I've been, and I'm in full agreement. I, you know, I think beyond that, I think that this, if we even just look at what kind of a resource the facility can be, it's tremendous. Um, you know, we have all these folks who are coming to town who have to stay either with families or in hotels, and some as far away as Lafayette, 
um, having an overnight facility here is is going to be a tremendous asset. And um, and I think culturally that that plays into the, the concept of experience. So in order for an individual to 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 assimilate, not even to assimilate, just to, to interact with the culture, they need to experience something within that culture. Um, that's something that Robert <laughs> knows very well with the, with, with the tour kind of being this, this way of experiencing something. But um, even within a, a, a culture, um, individuals within that culture need to have these experiences that they, they can re recollect in their memory. Um, that's something that, that plays into this concept of a canon or having these items um, available to access in a place, a very nice space. Yeah, where, where people can come and visit the culture and have their own experience, something similar to what we do in prime time, where everyone reads the same book. And uh, we talk about how people interpreted that book differently. It's a very vital kernel of what happens in prime time. And, and the interesting thing is that everyone is experiencing the same thing, but everyone's getting something different from it. And that conversation and the communication that comes out of that is what the sticky little membranes that make the culture cool. Um, and so having a space where those things can happen is extremely important yeah. for individuals within the community um, and also people who may be, may be visiting. Um, and so it's important, it's, it's important for people to be able to have this place to experience this camp. But it's also very important for people to have a place to make a mess, mm -hmm. to take that can and maybe bring the ideas into another room and make something, make something good, make something bad, make something that probably needs three or four more versions, but, but create something from that mm -hmm. with other people. Very interesting. Well, you know, I was thinking the other day about how I like to picture St. Luke's in my head. And um, I, I think, in a way, it's the old version of a community center. Yeah. You know, we've abandoned that whole idea of community centers. And Nunu has very much become one here. And uh, I remember being here with my staff years ago to try to have a retreat on a day that y'all were closed. And because our cars were parked here, people kept stopping in and saying, well, what's going on? <laughs> can, can, we, can we join you? And I had to turn people away and say, listen, um, we're meeting and it's staff. So, um, but this, I mean, we're talking about a real community center and a place where the community uh, makes it what it is. And so culture needs space and time, like every existence needs space and time. But, but it's, it's very important to either have a physical or a digital space and a time within that space to devote to a community. Um, and so physical space or digital space is extremely important to the vitality of a culture. Um, and if, if, if people, if, if there is no digital space, there needs to be a physical space. Yeah. And perhaps there can be both. Yeah. That would be ideal. Yes. Well, thank you, Haley. Thank you. Gosh, I appreciate your perspective and um, thinking about what the young people here need is yeah. something I think that's really important to the future model. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for you? All right, Gay Sandoz, I want to bring you up. Uh, Gay is the director of the LSU Ag Center Food Incubator, which sounds delicious, doesn't it? And um, she was also the director of, uh, what is it called in Norco? Um, it's Edible Enterprises. And Edible Enterprises. And ironically, my organization funded Edible Enterprises way back in the day. Yes. The little grant. Yes. And um, we we're so glad you're here because, as you all can tell, I'm interested too in what can happen in that space regarding food. Um, there's a kitchen. And you know, a, a big kitchen. And I'll tell you this first of all, I am originally from Opelousas, Louisiana. My uncle was uh, mayor of Washington, and my um, grandfather, Aunt Nicholson, owned a lumberyard in Opelousas. So I am grounded in this area. I love it. I live in Baton Rouge now. But um, who was the mayor? Gant Nicholson. He was the mayor also. Oh, uh, Gant Jr., yeah. Gant Jr. was uh, the mayor of Washington. Of course, that was a long time ago. 
Um, and my cousins, the Nicholsons and Dayton's, live in Opelousas now. So they're 35 first cousins, by the way. So I grew up, I grew up crawfishing and around the food industry. My background is in food. I have been in the food business since I was five years old. Um, became the director of the Ella Child Labor. <laughs> well, we cooked. But um, I love this idea. And um, just to tell you, I had a vision um, to open up a food incubator at LSU. And that vision came because uh, as director of research and development for Cajun Injector, I had nowhere to go for information or to help help my business, you know, have to help Cajun Injector. So I went to the chancellor, and for three years, I emailed that chancellor, and I said, I want you to open up a food incubator on the LSU campus. I got no response for, for a while, and then finally he emailed me back, and I started corresponding with him, but I just had a dream, and I just kept emailing that chancellor, and he finally, to make it happen. he finally called me, and he goes, look, I don't have much money, but I'll hire you to open up a food incubator. And I literally, he gave me $250,000, which is not much, um, to renovate a building and buy equipment. So I said, well, how long do I have to do this? And he said, a year. And I looked around the LSU campus, and as you well know, there's a lot of politics um, in universities. Um, so without anyone knowing, I just ran through and opened up an incubator. In six months, I broke every rule on campus. No one knew what I was doing. I literally did, and you can ask the chancellor now because he just shakes his head at me. I, I opened up a space about a thousand feet, a thousand square feet, and I hung a banner up there. It said LSU Accent Food Incubator. And I, I thought the chancellor was going to have a heart attack. But he walked in the building and saw that banner because they liked shiny and new. But I knew that I didn't need shiny and new. So I opened up the food incubator by getting the blessing of the Department of Health and Hospitals. And in six months, I had it open with seventy-five thousand dollars worth of equipment that I purchased. It was all reused, you know, used, used equipment, but it didn't matter. I just needed that permanent space. I opened up with ten companies in six months. I had ten companies and two food processors in a big kettle. Um, we were so successful, and so many people wanted to come and make food products. Uh, one year later, we received a two and a half million dollar grant from the state, and with that grant money, we've been able to buy a million dollars worth of equipment and fund five hundred thousand dollars worth of salaries. Ooh, that's fabulous! It is. It was such a great story, and it's yes. not just because of me. I had a team behind me, and a chancellor, of course, is still my friend. Um, but no one believed in it when I went on campus. No one liked the idea of having food people, small businesses, come to LSU and start because they're very needy, they're hard to work with. Um, but I knew that we could do it. And, um, in, in two years, we had 20, 20 new tenants, new food wow. businesses. And now we are operating with 35 companies. We're still in that 1,000 square foot building. Now we. I've invaded other people's property on campus, which they're not very happy about. But um, so I have three spaces. I have a bakery section, and um, we have five or six bakeries and candy makers, and we have our processing facility that does sauces and barbecue sauces and salad dressings. Uh, we've produced over 140 tons of product in three and a half years. We're still new, um, and we have our companies or in over 2,000 grocery stores in Louisiana, Texas, and Alabama. Wow. We're That's work, impressive. We work very closely with Whole Foods. And um, I now have a sign that will be put in, hopefully, all the stores in Louisiana. My goal is to get them in the stores. So you'll walk in Rouse's, and on the end cap, you'll see handcrafted at the LSU Accent or Food Incubator. Wow. Um, my offer to you, if this becomes a reality, is to become your technical support um, because you need that sa food safety and food technical experience. I have three food scientists. I'm just the creative person. But um, so you, you, we can offer that to you, that technical support and that LSU name because that does carry a lot of weight. It does. And, um, you know, when I first saw that kitchen, I, you know, Mavis had talked about doing cooking lessons in French. I know Rita, you're such a good cook, but 
where they could be in their teaching classes. We thought about a food commissary for, you know, as a resource to this whole area. And then, of course, having a real food incubator um, in that space could be something that, you know, draws grants or, or, or draws funds. Yeah. All of these things sort of, in my mind, are connected. The, the making the, the, the financial part of the operation um, viable in reinforcing the culture and, and showcasing the culture and you know, doing something that's not done in a lot of places. But having you guys on board with it would be just tremendous. Yeah, and we've created, um, like I said, 35 companies and those companies employ at least one or two people full time and at least seven or eight people part time. Um, you can see them in the grocery stores, you can see them at the farmer's markets. I mean, if, if they work together, it's, like you said, they become a group, and they're all friends now, you can Facebook them. Um, you can face, you can Google our food incubator. We're known now internationally, and nationally we have tours all the time. Tomorrow, we actually have a team building. The provost office has asked us to do a team building cooking class, so I just hired an instructor, and they'll come in and do a cooking class. Tomorrow, which I kind of organize, but um, that happens. Um, and it's very interesting how many people fall in love with a food incubator. I mean, it's still small, it's still ugly, it still has that banner. <laughs> but um, they've given us money to build a new plant, which we're renovating right now, a warehouse. We have a full bottling plant going in to help those entrepreneurs grow. Um, so everyone asks us to give a tour of our food incubator. I don't, it's really amazing to me. The president- People can relate to food. They can relate to small businesses, number one, and they can relate to food. And so I have been to Slovakia to help them open up a food incubator there. I was asked to go to Hungary this summer. I haven't accepted that. I can only go so many times yeah. to Eastern <laughs> Europe. But they haven't asked me to go to Italy or France yet, but I'm waiting for that. But I, I think it's so cool that we can actually start this incubator with literally 75, two food processors, honestly. I didn't even wow. spend the $75,000 yet. Now, now I have a million dollars, which I'm spending on bigger equipment. Yeah. So if well, anybody I, wants to come see it, please feel free to I come think see we it. might need the email address of your chancellor so we can start telling them we want you to open up a satellite here. No, we've been around the state. Uh, talking to New Orleans and every different parishes of assets about food incubators, so we do go around and offer our uh, support as the technical part because you do need technical yeah. services uh, to to run a successful food incubator. Yeah, they can go in and cook all day long, but you just need somebody to come give them lessons on safety and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, connecting with the stores and they're they're just having a ball. Do you uh, there? Do you know about any food incubators in this area? Uh, there's a food hub that's been built in Lafayette. Uh, they are trying to open it right now. Now I'm I'm not endorsing it until the Department of Health and Hospital gives that blessing to them. Yeah, that's where you, you start with that first. Not yeah. you don't build it and then go ask them. Yeah, don't do that. Can you? The laws can come into play. People don't like you to tell them what to do. They like you to ask. Can you reveal the location? The, uh, that food hub is opened by uh, a fellow named Zach. I can't remember his last name. But it seems like it's in the outskirts of town. I'll have to, I'll have to email you that email address. Where is it? It's in Lafayette. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. yeah, we need to go over no, no, no. And then they, they they have some sort of pavilion they're building in Lafayette downtown where they want to do a farmers market and they want to put another food incubator there. I've been asked to another meeting. You only need so many in the area, right? Uh, so they, they're, it's a lot of fun to come. I, we have tours where people come in and see them processing. They'll see them making the salad dressing we're making, um, and and some of our tenants are even applying for those reality shows, <laughs> the short takes. Yeah. It's so it's Well, imagine fun. doing the tours in French. Oh, yeah, that would be better. I mean, can you imagine that? That's what we're here today to do. So, I don't speak French, but I can look. My son lives in Provence, uh, trying to go back to his roots, and he is, he's fluent in French. Wow. 
bring him back so, over here. So one thing to remember is that this, this, um, the kitchen um, has all the equipment already. You've got more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and the kitchen doesn't have to be renovated. Right. It's, well, it's all think. Yeah. It's probably got to, there's certain things that have to be permitted as a processor. It's probably, you know, yeah, we could, but we could do that. So, um, so my question is this, we, we receive, we, we have requests for chefs to come in all the time here. Uh, so we had a, um, the French consulate has been very kind to us in the past, you know, and have, they kind of steer chefs our way. Um, we have uh, a chef from Cuba that was here for a bit and he's going to be coming for three weeks. Mm -hmm. One of the things we try to do is when people, when people visit Louisiana or visit Warrenville is to provide them with multi-layered experiences. So of course the rural experience here in Acadiana, um, we like to have, we like them to plug into Baton Rouge because I think it's in, in order to understand Louisiana, you almost have to, you almost have to understand the political element that exists, you know, within the state and what better place than the, the capital city. And also New Orleans, people, they've got to go to New Orleans because if they don't, you know, they feel like they've left without without seeing the entire state. So, um, so in Baton Rouge, I mean, if we have a chef that comes in, I mean, could you guys receive that chef, and would you be open to providing him with a space to do a workshop or, or a demonstration, her. or or her, or you? <laughs> Look, yes. him or her. I or her. Or her. Or her. Him or her. Uh, the chef. I was talking specifically about the Cuban chef. Yes, and one of the places that I actually borrowed, because the chancellor told me I couldn't use it, but I, I am, <laughs> is our demo kitchen. It's a beautiful recording <coughs> studio oh, wow. where we teach people how to go on TV and promote their products. Wow. Um, I'm a TV chef for Tony Satchers as well, mm -hmm. uh, and that I have a lot of jobs, but um, I did that when I became divorced. Um, but okay. This beautiful demo kitchen is perfect for chefs, and we have chefs from all over the country coming. We give them presentations about the food incubator. So the idea when they Could come that. when they when they come here, we say that they're doing a culinary residency. Mm -hmm. So um, and what we say to them is that we provide you with free accommodations um, in Orneville. They're going to do the same thing in New Orleans. Um, um, but they have to get something back other than just cooking. So we try to plug them into a local school um, or invite school kids to come and watch. Um, they also stage in um, restaurants so that way they can share their experiences with other, other chefs and they'll also learn. Right? And also they uh, try to create an opportunity for them to do some type of pop-up um, uh, to invite you know, the general public, which could also serve as a fundraiser. Right. right. So, you know, any of that that you're interested in would, would be fantastic because we don't, we don't, uh, the Baton Rouge is our missing link right now in regards to the food piece. And you need to come look at the, the beautiful kitchen we have. Okay. Place. I know we're supposed to be talking about St. Luke, but this no, ties into St. Luke. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, does. it, does. it all yeah. ties in. I think it all ties together. It does. Yeah. And uh, Amy is, Amy's, Amy's organization is a Sending a hand to us for the future because yeah, we are going to take that hand and we are going to, uh, we'll be like you with the chancellor. We'll email you and say, please come help. And um, I'm just so looking forward to all the opportunities. Later in the day, we're all going to be able to sit around and vision and dream a little about what um, can happen in that facility, which will very soon be yes. belong to the parish. And I would build it and not spend too much money on it, but just. No. That's Make it a place like yeah. the incubator. That's right. right. It's it's all in its perception. It's not in our building. I and mean, if you see it, we're we're in the old poultry building. Fuck way. We we cleaned out the kitchen with that two hundred thousand dollars. 
kick the chickens out and we made the incubator right there. <laughs> we should have let the chickens stay and just cook us. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. Um, we're very lucky to have Camille Lene and Lily Heber with us. They are young filmmakers and um, they have made a really interesting film about um, the Cajun language and Cajun culture and um, Francophonie. So um, they're going to show us what they've been working on and it's called A Great New. And the, the, um, we're going to also talk about the film and ask any questions that we have when we're going to complete. And I know um, that also the subject of their film, which name is Jordan Thibodeau, he's here with us as well. So we're very fortunate to have you here. Do you all want to say anything before the movie starts? Okay. Awesome. First off, thank you so much for having us. And we've just come straight from New Orleans, so sorry about the technical delay. Um, the only thing I wanted to correct is we're, we're making a film about French in Louisiana as it's spoken today. So not just Cajun, but we're also hoping to get Cajun Creole, Native American, and different variants. So I just wanted to correct that. Um, and yeah, we have Jordan here with us. He um, also speaks wonderful French, so if you have questions after, we can answer it, but mostly you should just talk to him. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I'm just streaming this off my phone, so we'll see how far we can get on my internet connection. Yeah. Okay, fingers crossed. When I was young, there were little jujus and all that. But after that, when I was 10 years old, après ça, j'ai commencé mon dé pour une vente. Bon, je voulais une vente. Chaque année, ils m'ont dit, non, je voulais une vache. Et ma père, il a grandi avec les, les vaches, et tous les animaux, les jardins, tout ça, c'est tout ça. Il était bien fatigué avec tout ça. Il a dit, non, non, non. Tu n'as pas besoin d'une vache. Quoi tu vas faire avec une vache Moi, je vais commencer une heure. OK Oh, non. Et genre, quand je suis grand, moi je vais acheter un, un petit morceau de pays pour moi. Et moi je vais élever des animaux. Et c'est ça que j'ai fait. Et c'est pour ça que je travaille. J'ai commencé à travailler juste, juste pour gagner assez d'argent pour acheter un petit morceau de pays. Et les animaux, les vaches, les cochons et tout ça. C'est ça que j'ai voulu. Pour moi, ça c'est le succès. C'est pas d'argent, c'est juste d'être heureux. Il est content. Il met mon chapeau. Gay, gay, gay. Ouais, tu peux rester si tu veux. Si tu vas m'aider. Tu vas m'aider Un petit trop. Bien fait. C'est assez. Ah ah, tire pas la ligne là. L'autre bord. L'autre bord. C'est juste quelque chose que j'aime. J'aime travailler avec, travailler avec les, les animaux, et avec mes mains. Je vais juste continuer. C'est difficile, c'est pas comme les autres. Il faut voir, dans les autres fois, la terre était, était moins, moins chère. Et c'était plus facile. Mais à ce terre, tu peux pas... Tu ne peux pas faire d'argent, tu ne peux pas gagner rien. C'est trop cher. Tout quelque chose est trop cher. Les tracteurs, c'était 25 000 piastres. Les terres, you know. et, et, et tu vas, tu vas vendre une, une, une cochon, pourquoi 
80 piastres. C'est une tas de cochons pour, <rire> pour payer pour tous les tares et, euh, et les tracteurs et tout ça, mais quand même. C'est comment tu appelles euh, un label, euh, I guess. Quand j'ai acheté ce morceau de pays ici, c'était juste un morceau de bois. J'ai coupé les arbres. C'était plus belle que ça. Il y avait une grande route, un déluge, proche, trois mois passés. Mais avant ça, c'était une belle place. Il y avait des arbres, c'était tout vert. Arrête, toi. Oh. Il va te manger. Doucement, ok? Pas si vite et pas une surprise. Si c'est une surprise, il, sera, il aura peur, ok? Il peut grandir, hein? Tu vois ces grands dents? Il y a des grands dents, hein? J'allais à la school, j'avais un ami, euh, s'appelle Mike Como. Et son grand-père et grand-mère a commencé un, un petit marché. Et il a fait des boudins et, et tout ça. Il a fait ça longtemps et, et dans les, les, les années euh, 80, son père a acheté le, le business et a continué. Et quand j'étais dans la school, on allait là pour, euh, pour couper tous les chevreux et faire des saucisses et, et tout ça pour, pour les, les hommes qui ont fait la chasse. Moi j'ai quitté la school avant j'étais fini, mais quand même. Il y avait un tas de monde qui veut me dire euh, John va faire ça, va faire ça et, et un autre va dire va faire ça et c'était deux choses différentes. Et moi j'allais dans l'avant et j'ai demandé Monsieur Ray, qui, qui est mon boss, you know? Et il dit Oh mais le cream flutes. Après ça j'allais back dans l'arrière et moi j'ai juste commencé. C'est toi go, va faire ça, va faire ça. Et j'ai juste commencé comme ça. Et ici, c'est juste le glacier, le, le light box. C'est comment tu appelles ça, un glacier? I don't know, it's fresh people say. <rire> Et c'est une messe. Parce que c'est plein de chevreux. À ça. Bon, j'ai commencé par le français quand j'étais petit. On a resté juste à côté de ma grand-mère. Et euh, chaque après-midi, elle m'a fait des amis. Et, euh, elle a parlé français tout le temps. C'était la langue de ma famille, c'était la langue de, de notre histoire, notre culture. Et j'ai fait une point d'apprendre ça. Et je connais que c'est pas parfait, j'ai oublié un tas, et, mais je sais quand même. Je connais qu'il y a un tas de choses que j'ai dit dans une, une mauvaise manière, mais c'est le, le meilleur que je pourrais faire. C'est mieux que rien. You know? Oh, ici on a besoin de saucisses. Parce que pour moi, c'est ça qui est triste. 
la plupart du monde ici, moi je crois, ne parlent pas français juste parce qu'ils sont honte d'essai. Ils sont honte. Et c'est tout. Parce qu'ils peuvent me comprendre, mais ils vont répondre en anglais parce qu'ils sont honte. Et pour moi, quand même, quand même, c'est. Ça sent mauvais, moi je vais essayer. Parce que c'est mieux que rien. Et c'est pour ça que j'ai élevé mes petites filles en français. Je parle juste en français avec ma petite fille. Elle aime ça une top. Elle connaît que ça me fait fier. Et elle est fière, you know. Si tu gagnes rien, comment je vais faire un gros mot Chante pour les Madigas Chante Chante pour les voisins là Donnez quelque chose pour les Madigas Donnez quelque chose pour les Madigas Donnez quelque chose pour les Madigas Mon titre, c'est moi, je suis le capitaine. Le capitaine, c'est le, le boss de les Mardi Gras. Parce que tous les, tous les Mardi Gras, vont, ils sont les malfacteurs. Ils seront bien connus, ils vont casser tout quelque chose, ils vont batailler, ils vont déchirer tous les cours de les voisins et tout ça. Et c'est mon job, et les vilains, c'est mon job d'aller monter les voisins. Si, si on peut entrer, entrer, tout ça. Mais aussi, c'est pour uh, qui peut me l'aider, you know. C'est mes chers, you know. Do you want that bird? Comment tu veux cette poule là? Tout ça, il y a un tas de chevaux, mais aussi il y a un tas de flots et tout ça, c'est proche comme le nouveau mode de you know? Mais ici, c'est juste le vieux moyen. Euh, tu peux voir, c'est tout le monde gras, il y, a, il y a plus de spectateurs et tout ça. Euh, il y a un tas de monstres au pied. Mais c'est pas comme les autres fois, il n'y a, a pas un tas de monde qui a venu de les comprendre, qui a des chevaux, qui a des. You know? Tout le monde reste dans la vie. So. Que tu fais quelque chose que moi j'ai fait. 
la même dans les autres cours. Parce qu'il n'y a, a pas une table de place qui va continuer, continuer les de, de vieux moyens. Et pas juste ici. Il y a tout partout dans, tout dans les États-Unis et tout partout du monde. Il y, a, il y a trop du monde qui veut commencer les, les nouveaux moyens avec tout quelque chose. C'est bien important de faire les, les vieux moyens. Sure enough, I'm, I'm listening to some Algis Roger and I'm looking at the picture and I'm like, 
Well, that's Mr. Foreman. <laughs> and I never knew, you know, and it was going all over and they were sticking to my family. <laughs> so I said, oh, yeah. That's great. I said, I'm going to go. So I went with him and I said, Mr. Foreman, I said, I'd like to learn, you know. They said, okay, man, buy your fiddle. So I went and I said, Mr. Foreman, I said, Mr. Foreman, and I finally bought my fiddle. I was going to eat it out of the fiddle. I was going to horrible and jump the fiddle. And, uh, by the time I saved the money and bought that, I went back to him. Within two weeks, he was dead. He never let me show him no more. <laughs> so I put it up and I said, What are you going to mess with? And I ended up getting rid of everything. I'm about five, six years later when my grandma died. Uh, I had been, we'd always sing in the house. She loved music and she, she'd sing her in the room. And uh, I, mean, I made up my mind that I was going to learn her. So I took her and got me another one and laid in the house until I scratch out a handful of songs. You know? And after that, I was like, she's a bitch reading. You know what I mean? It's a bitch reading. And I went and I learned a lot of songs with a bitch reading. And after that, I don't know. That's it. I'm going to learn some more tomorrow. She always sings some funny stuff, you know. But Lamont, she was from Reading. 
and they had a half a fat, if you remember that, they lived right up the road from him. And she'd always tell me, that happened, he'd make them songs, and he'd come at the house. So I could sing a farm, because look, he couldn't sing. <laughs> and it was true, I mean, he couldn't sing a farm. <laughs> but uh, he, he'd go at the house, and she'd sing, sing on the board. But I mean, she'd just sing all kinds of stuff. But to be honest with you, I couldn't, I couldn't think of a song that I would say I learned from her. I mean, maybe I did, or maybe I learned them from watching, I mean, Randall on TV, you know, because that was like religious. <laughs> that was, you was going to sit and put the front window. When that was going to come on TV, you was going to sit and watch it. You was going to dance in the living room. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. That was, that was a big thing. You sit in the house and sit in the shit like that. I should have made you a uh, What is your French education? Are you look, looking to read or how are you furthering? You were saying you're forgetting words. Yeah, you're forgetting words, but you. Well, I forget words, but also they got other words I never knew. You know what I mean? Uh, but I don't know. Y'all want to know some funny stuff? I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can, like, write. Does it class in my yard? I can, I can write enough to where you understand it. It's going to be wrong, but you're going to get it, you know? They got uh, on your little cell phone, you can switch to a French keyboard. Oh, yeah. And I understand it. the concept of how it's written, right? You don't know truly how to spell it. Uh -huh. So I just type it, I let the autocorrect fix it, and I pay attention to what it does when it fixes it. Oh, and I've been doing that for like, I don't know, a handful of years, and I can like, you know, the now. Not sit <laughs> I mean, I can write, you know. But um, I've been using autocorrect on text, <laughs> on text message. And uh, I don't know, they got a lot of them. I'm friends with a lot of French people, you know, like, I don't know, educated people, you know, and they all <laughs> talk and write letters and all this, and I just pay attention. I mean, really, I'm not like uh, reading books or reading conversations, you know, on Facebook or whatever. And if I don't know something, I'll look it up. I don't know, or anything like that. You mentioned in, in, the movie, in the film, you mentioned this about um, some people are afraid to Present to you their project. 
Uh-huh. What was your reaction? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I mean, she looked pretty. Just if I can come around and film you for a while, that's okay. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay, yep. Yeah. It was very, it was very straightforward. Simple. I actually didn't have a big idea of what the project was. Yeah, just ask, yeah, yeah. She just asked if she could film, and I said okay. <laughs> I didn't even know what she was doing it for. And, and along the way, she's like, oh, this, this, and you know, like. I kind of feel like I can get more information as it moves, you know? But, I don't know, I'm kind of over there. And so, how, it was his birthday the first time I met him. Did he even tell me? You just like... Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was in Henderson. It was on an airboat. So, and uh, how are your neighbors, the one who speak French, did they want it to be part of the film, or did Some, they ask you what happened? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, and sometimes, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I've had a couple of people like in the past, like foreign people that like, came that was, you know, filming all kinds of things. They just asked me to do a quick interview or something. And anytime someone asks me that normally, I say, well, I don't know why you're wasting your time with me. When you can go meet like the seven year old man across the street that's more real deal than I could ever be in a thousand years, you know what I mean? And every now and then we're trying to visit with something like that. And I remember one day, uh, we had gone in my neighbors across the street and just to visit with him and introduce ourselves and we said, not me, but introduce them, you know. And uh, oh, it's all going good, He's, you know, making a little visit and all of a sudden when that camera came out and I mean he had a face like, you better put that up right now. And he was mad, you know. And they weren't talking about that. But I also think some people in that generation were they getting mocked, you know what I mean? That they don't feel like people's coming with good intent. That they come and I don't know, like the film is so they can bring it back home to my family. You know what I mean? Because they raised so much that they backwards and ridiculous. You know? Because they're burning so many people's heads. That's a shame. So after after your experience with Lily and Kenny, um, do you would you do it again? Would you more? You know, serving the purpose of oh, yeah. getting the people to know that we still speak French. Oh, here. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. 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 That's, uh, I don't know. That's very important to me. That's always been very important to me. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No <laughs> <laughs>